Hello, welcome back. My name is Dalton Chen, and this is part three of the presentation to the IIIEE Alumni Conference. We ran out of time for part three at the actual conference, so I've recorded this the next day. And uh, I'll present part three of the economic theory, and I'll also add in another section to just uh, answer again the questions in, that were put forward at the, at the session. So part three, the economic theory for the global carbon reward is new and it expands on neoclassical economics. And this is why the policy is special in that it's not just a policy, it's an economic theory added to standard economics to help explain and justify the policy and to help us understand the market value better. I cannot say that this new theory, the expanded theory is proven, uh, you can judge for yourself if it makes sense. It's explained in Appendix A of our policy working paper that you can download from our website or you can apply to review it. So in summary, the standard theory for the market failure, I just want to point out it has some major weaknesses that are unresolved. So what I claim is that although taxes are the preeminent policy of standard economics using the theory of Arthur Pigou, a key problem with that policy for decarbonizing our economy is that it's rather unpopular. Certainly, we haven't been able to scale up carbon taxes to the level needed, and the average price on carbon today globally is only about $6 per tonne on average. The social discount rate of standard economics is highly subjective. The discount rate is um, chosen by economists based on what they think uh, is reasonable for investing. That's somewhat descriptive. It could be 3% or it could be significantly lower if the economist or policymaker thinks we need to decarbonize more quickly. However, um, despite what people prefer or recommend, it doesn't necessarily translate into policy in the real world. Therefore, the discount rate is somewhat of a frustrating topic because it's a dial that can be dialed up or down to um, reduce taxes with a high discount rate or increase taxes with a lower discount rate. There are major uncertainties in the damage function. This has always been the case um, because the damages can be very large. And as we learn more about climate change, the revisions tend to indicate that we've previously underestimated the economic damages of global warming. Time horizons uh, for political systems, for policy, for governments, central banks, generally for most institutions, are uh, typically only two or three years. Whereas earth systems, the way we understand earth systems is generally of a much longer time horizon. For example, uh, we tend to think of global warming over a hundred year period. If we look at the um, climate system as, as a complex system and we want to understand it, we might need to look at time horizons going back in time for thousands of years, tens of thousands of years indeed, you could argue hundreds of thousands or millions of years or even billions of years to understand the climate and also to understand Earth systems. So there is a mismatch between human time horizons of institutions tend to be short, whereas Earth systems involve long time horizons. Systemic risks are growing. As we deliberate over taxes, over policies that are somewhat weak, we've been deliberating over uh, policies for 10, 20 years or longer. Meanwhile, the risks are building. We have high emissions. We're learning that climate change is more dangerous and we're, we're beginning to realize there are positive feedbacks and so on. And so risks are building in the whole system, in the economy and so on. Uh, positive feedbacks I just mentioned. There um, are more scientists pointing out that uh, there are a number of positive feedbacks at play 
for example, thawing of permafrost, melting of sea ice, um, positive feedbacks could be the emissions from the Amazonian rainforest, for example, as it begins to desiccate with changes in rainfall. These systems are complex and they can be nonlinear. Ecosystems in particular can be highly nonlinear if keystone species are drop out of the food web. Um, there could be serious changes, significant changes, for example. In standard economics and uh, in economics generally, there's still debate and uncertainty about how to value ecosystems anyway from an economic perspective. So we have natural capital and other ideas, but they don't necessarily scratch that itch. There's always some um, debate over what it really means to value nature. Finally, green growth, degrowth, steady state models or ideas that come from, um, say, ecological economics, as an example, they appear to be untenable as solutions to climate change, at least in my opinion. Whilst they um, have some positive features, like green growth proposes innovative finance, green finance, it doesn't really seem to scale up to provide exponential change. Uh, degrowth has issues because it's unclear how it be implemented, what exactly is the policy, how do we manage energy, debt, uh, the financial system. Steady state has weaknesses too because how do you actually implement a steady state economy? Who's going to be in charge? What kind of policy would it be? Um, does it require giving up on capitalism and moving to uh, some form of socialism? I, I, I can't answer those questions. Um, I'm not going to try to answer them here, but... Um, the economic theory that I'm presenting, it does appear to offer an alternative and some answers. So the expanded economic theory, um, it describes a new development pathway for economic growth or economic development, and I'm calling it optimal growth. So it appears that optimal growth could very well meet these criteria. Um, it's consistent with neoclassical theory. In other words, it's building on top of it. It's not throwing it away. It does appear to have epistemic roots. I'll discuss that. It can address or appears to address the problem of excessive debt, because debt is part of the problem. It employs control system theory. This is important because control system theory, it actually um, interfaces with the the, um, the natural sciences, say engineering, uh, statistics, thermodynamics, so on. They use control system theory. It's a very well established uh, idea in electronics, chemical engineering, mechanics, and so on. The model for optimal growth, as I'll explain, it is analogous to ecosystems in the way that they can and do achieve net zero carbon. I'll talk about that later. It appears to have uh, the features of a thermodynamically plausible solution. So this really ties in with the discussion of net zero for ecosystems and other systems. I'll talk about that. Uh, it addresses systemic risk. Indeed, the whole policy is framed by risk rather than costs. It addresses trade-offs, uh, which are understood or can be understood through the notion of a Prudhoe frontier. That's explained in Appendix B of the policy working paper. Uh, we won't actually cover that topic in this presentation. It resolves time discounting dilemmas. That's explained in the paper. We might touch on that in this section, part three. It offers a new value context based on protection and regeneration. So I'll, uh, talk about that towards the end. So let's move on and see what optimal growth is about. A good place to start is the IPCC report, the recent report, and their evaluation of the risks for, um, in this case, land-based systems. So land-based systems um, are exposed to wildfires with global heating. Uh, as you could imagine, if there are droughts uh, and a lot of vegetation, there's a fire risk. And these 
diagrams are known as the burning embers diagrams and uh, the color codes refer to levels of risk. So yellow is moderate risk. Um, going to orange and red is high risk, very high risk or extremely high risk. It's a dark um, purpley color. And the risks from global warming in this report are higher than in previous reports. So the direction of travel is towards understanding that there are higher risks than what we previously believed. We're currently at about 1.2 degrees of average global warming, and the uh, Paris Agreement recommends staying between one and a half to two degrees. And if we were to go beyond one and a half or even two degrees, it becomes clear that we're moving into a high risk situation for wildfire, permafrost degradation, biodiversity loss, uh, water scarcity, tree mortality, and so on and so forth. So you can read the IPCC report itself. But the point here is that we're entertaining uh, significantly higher risks across the board should we exceed one and a half to two degrees. Now, thinking about what leading economists have recommended in the past. Um, I'd like to refer to William Nordhaus and Lord Nicholas Stern because they're very well known. William Nordhaus, he developed the DICE model. And when he presented for his Nobel, he uh, presented a chart that uh, showed the so-called optimal warming with the ideal carbon tax based on his estimate of the social cost of carbon. And you could check his presentation yourself, but uh, his optimal warming was in the range of three to four degrees. Now, um, now that we know more about the damages, my presumption is that the world doesn't want to go to three to four degrees. It's too dangerous, too costly, too risky. Now, if we follow the advice of Lord Nicholas Stern and the High level commission on carbon pricing, they decided not to bother with calculating, estimating the social cost of carbon. They just said, look, why don't we just price carbon to stay around one and a half, two degrees? And that's what they did. However, what I would like to emphasize with this slide is the notion that neither of these uh, options will really solve our problem with global warming. If we had a, a particularly low social cost of carbon, maybe the discount rate's higher, the damage function is too low, we would end up with too much global warming. We'd have lower taxes, but excessively dangerous global warming. If we change the numbers and the models or whatever argument you use, if we go to a much higher tax for a lower warming event, one and a half to two degrees, for example, then we have another problem, that is high taxes are unpopular. We don't seem to be able to solicit the cooperation through the political systems of the world to implement such high taxes globally. This has historically been the case. And my point is that the neoclassical approach, standard economics based on search cost of carbon, the carbon tax is failing as a, if you like, as a paradigm. So what is the, the new theory that can address this particular problem, which is quite confusing and frustrating? I'd like to attract your attention to this table uh, to explain the approach. This is not the theory itself. It's just an example of a, um, a classification table that's based on two binary options. So the columns in this example are talking about different resources that are available to society. So some resources are excludable and others are non-excludable, meaning um, if a resource is excludable, it means not everybody everywhere in the world all the time can get access to those resources. So for example, um, if we were talking about uh, access to say abundant fresh water, if you live in a, an area, a region that has water, it's accessible. It's, it's, you're not, uh, it, it, it is excluded because people who don't have access to that water can't get it. But then there are other resources such as, um, let's say, the atmosphere. Everybody, everywhere, all the time can get access to the atmosphere. So that's non-excludable. 
In terms of the rows, uh, non-rivalrous and rivalrous refers to, to whether um, you have to compete for the resources in terms, effectively in terms of price, uh, meaning that if there's high demand, is the resource elastic or inelastic? Now, if it's um, inelastic, then there's going to be competition. It's going to be rivalrous. So, for example, in a place where there's a finite water supply, um, there's going to be rivalry or competition over the available water. So uh, that, that water could become a private good, for example, if somebody owned the water and was selling it. Non-rivalrous examples might be something like a Wi-Fi connection. If there's enough bandwidth, everybody can get access to the internet uh, if you're in range, if you can afford to pay for it. So it's non-rivalrous from the point of view the supply can keep growing. Now, I just want to cover this. This is well known in economics. This isn't new at all, at all, of course. But I just want you to focus on the fact that this table is basically explaining the main options that are social and physical for, for goods. And in this way, we can understand the different types of goods as a, as a classification table. And essentially, we're doing the same thing here. This is the new theory, but we're doing it for pricing carbon. So we have columns uh, where the binary options are to do with the unit of account of the instrument in the policy. So we can have policies that rely on official money, the fiat currencies, or we can introduce a new unit of account based on carbon. Uh, an example is the emissions permit in a cap and trade scheme. That's a new instrument that's tradable. It's got carbon units. Carbon tax doesn't need that. It just relies on taxes based in the national fiat currency. The rows uh, are binary options. We can have either sticks, that's negative uh, pricing, if you like, or carrots, positive pricing. So negative pricing, quite clearly, it's taxes, cap and trade, positive pricing. You have a subsidy. And in this case, in the fourth quadrant is the new policy I put forward being our carbon reward or the global carbon reward. And this is the uh, framework, if you like, the logical framework for entering into the new theory. And it's quite a powerful approach because it makes quite clear that there are certain combinations of social and physical relationships that constitute different ways to price carbon. Now, the carbon pricing matrix, which is that two by two matrix or the table, it can be expanded again to include not just the official policies from government, but voluntary policies or non-official approaches that are simply undertaken by market actors because they want to help mitigate uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So for example, some companies such as Microsoft or Shell, have adopted a voluntary tax, call it shadow price or um, just a voluntary tax. They um, also can employ some kind of carbon offsetting into their shadow carbon price. Uh, on the other side, we have a voluntary cap. This is actually quite popular nowadays. There are um, organizations that are asking companies to make pledges to go net zero by, say, the year 2040, 2050, or something like that. They're essentially voluntary caps, except they're caps measured in time, not in mass, because it's much more convenient to set your cap in time. Now, um, in the expanded matrix, we also have carbon credits shown, and you'll notice it's possible to, to use carbon credits to offset into voluntary caps, cap and trade, taxes even, and voluntary taxes. That's if, in the case of these policies, the regulator has to give permission for that, but if permission is given, it's possible. And what you're looking at here is what I believe is to be a much more um, sensible way to explain and understand carbon pricing because they're are multiple ways to price carbon. So that's something useful for people to think about and to apply it to, to their practice. Now we're going to get deeper into the theory. 
So we have our carbon pricing classification table based on the, the binary options, the columns referring to unit of account, the rows referring to store value. Now, quite clearly on the left side of the, the table, we have what is also known as a Pigouvian tax and then a Pigouvian subsidy. So Pigou's theory applies to, to the left column. And we know already through standard economics that the Pigouvian tax or carbon tax is justified or is used to address the social cost of carbon. This is the negative externality, uh, the cost on society that's not accounted for in the market failure. This is neoclassical. This is the way it's generally understood in economics textbooks, and I'm not dis disagreeing with it. I think it's actually a very sensible, logical theory. It makes perfectly good sense to me. However, it's not solving our problem. So is there something missing in standard economics? What I claim is that the mark failure in carbon is unique. It, it's involving a second type of externality. This second type is not Pigouvian. What it is is another kind of externality that actually associates with the carbon reward. And uh, on the right side of our carbon pricing classification table, we have two policies that actually invoke a new unit of account based on carbon. So it's a new tool, an instrument that can be traded. So in cap and trade, it's the emissions permit. That can be traded between polluters because some polluters have more, more permits than they need and others not enough. So they can trade with each other. And if it's done at low transaction cost, the theory of the coast, the coast theorem says those market actors, those polluters can achieve a Pareto optimal result in trading as they internalize the costs, the, the social cost of carbon. And what that means, in my opinion, my interpretation, what that means is the polluters are more likely to cooperate with the government and with each other because they have this flexibility to be able to trade with each other to optimize uh, their investing so that they don't have to pay so much for their pollution. The market can find that Pareto optimum. And in my, in my opinion, it helps to internalize the, the negative externality and it improves cooperation. Now, with the carbon reward, what I claim is that because we have a new instrument which can be traded, we can actually use this to do something similar, but we're going to internalize the cost of mitigation, reducing emissions, not the cost of polluting. That, that's the key difference. So this policy called carbon reward, it could also be called mitigate and trade. That that technically would be probably more accurate name, but carbon reward is just a more digestible name for the general public. So I've called, we've called it the carbon reward. Now, important is that if this is associating with a different externality, what is that externality? What I claim it is, is a systemic externality. The notion of a systemic externality does exist in the literature. It's just not very well developed. What I claim is that uh, the systemic externality that has been overlooked is actually the cost of fixing the structural problems in the economy that are driving the systemic risks. So what I claim is that our, our economic system as a system is in itself inadequate for resolving the market failure and the climate crisis. The key reason we have this systemic externality or the driver of it is the fact that we don't have enough cooperation to mitigate. Because we have this uh, political gridlock, I call it a societal um, lock-in effect. Call it a political gridlock though, just for ease of understanding. What it means is that we are unable to actually implement the ideal carbon tax and other ideal policies regulations and so on fast enough to actually internalize the social cost of carbon. And so what that means is as we are unable to implement ideal taxes or something like that, the climate problem is actually getting worse and worse. More emissions are going into the atmosphere. And that means we have a worse problem than we otherwise would like to have. 
And we cannot actually reach an efficient economy anyway with the tax because of the political gridlock. So to circumvent the political gridlock, I claim we need a, another price signal, another instrument, which is the carbon reward. And the formal name given to this hidden cost is the risk cost to carbon. And it quite literally is the cost of managing those systemic risks. I'll explain the conceptual model for the systemic externality. It's coming up in the following slides. So if you're not fully, um, if, if the idea is not fully clear, uh, I will help clarify that in the following slides. We're now going to have a look at the price quantity charts for supply and demand for the ideal carbon tax, which is known as the social cost to carbon and the ideal carbon reward, which is called the risk cost to carbon. So looking at the ideal tax, which is based on the theory of Arthur Pigou, it's also called a Pigouvian tax, what we can see is that um, we have a, a chart for demand, and demand is just simplified at, at the conceptual level is decreasing with quantity, and the price is increasing with supply. These are marginal prices. So the idea is that the economist undertakes an integrated assessment model using a damage function to estimate the, the cost of climate change. And then they have to assume a social discount rate, somewhere between, say, 2.5% or 3.5%, something like that, or even lower if you're concerned about global warming. But the idea is that the social cost of carbon comes out of the integrated system model, and that's intended to guide the ideal carbon tax. So with the tax applied to the goods and services that are causing pollution, the cost of supply increases, and so the idea is that the consumer, society, will consume less, and the theory is that the new equilibrium, or so-called equilibrium, the price discovery is low, uh, results in a lower quantity of consumption, and this is sometimes called the optimum, um, whereas the original situation was the market failure. And so that's the basic theory behind Buvian taxes and the negative externality, which is shown here to increase over time, over a long period of time, say 100 years. Now let's have a look at the systemic externality, which is a new concept. So the systemic externality is not the same as a positive externality from Arthur Pigou. This is an entirely different type of externality, which, as I said before, is a product of the economy as a system. The idea is that we, we want to price the um, reward according to that which is needed to solicit the minimum amount of carbon removal that we need, call that Q. So the quantity of greenhouse gas removal, Q, uh, is on the x-axis and the y-axis is the price. So the market failure here suggests that we only have a low rate of carbon removal in the um, free market. That's because there's not a great demand for carbon removal. Um, you know, some people might buy carbon credits to, to feel good about what they're doing. But if you exclude carbon offsetting, then that rate of carbon removal is going to be pretty low. So we need to increase the rate to achieve what is defined as the minimum required rate of greenhouse gas removal for achieving our climate objective, our carbon budget objective. Noting that that means that we expect an optimistically high rate of conventional mitigation. This is to avoid a moral hazard. And so uh, that, that's the concept. Remember, thinking back to the original chart of global emissions, that dark green color, we, we need to account for those residual emissions. So if we um, add to the marketplace an offer for carbon removal with a price denoted by the risk cost to carbon, then we expect to achieve more demand. So the new demand line intersects here, but noting that demand is not actually coming from society consumers. It's institutions that are actually buying the um, greenhouse gas services via the institution with the carbon exchange authority. 
for this reason, this chart, this supply demand chart, is not a conventional chart uh, relating to consumers and producers, certainly not to regular consumers, because it's the institution in this case that's buying service. That's one reason to understand that uh, there is no requirement for social time discount. What we have, we don't use a discount rate in conventional, uh, in, as conventionally used in um, the social cost of carbon. Here, we only need to set a planning horizon of approximately 100 years. I'll explain the, the planning horizon in the next slide. But if you can understand this chart, then you have some understanding of how the risk cost of carbon is calculated over time, and that's the ideal carbon reward value to correct or internalize, if you like, the systemic externality. In this slide, we're just going to have a closer look at the notion of time discounting and why uh, it's not actually used for managing the global carbon reward. We remind ourselves about what this chart means. This is the guaranteed floor price for the carbon currency or the carbon reward. And the ideal value of this chart is called the risk cost of carbon, as I showed you in the previous slide. The point I want to make here is that in the estimation of the risk cost of carbon or the floor price, there is no time discounting per se. There is no social discount needed because this is an institutional problem. It's a problem associated with the economy itself and not with consumers or producers per se. Therefore, there is no social discount rate and there's no time discounting using conventional formulas. The conventional formula for time discount is usually exponential. In this um, calculation or estimation of the risk cost of carbon, the floor price, the discount function, because there is one, it's just a bit unusual. The discount function here is essentially uniform in that there's zero discounting. Or in other words, we take 100% of the value through time until we get to the end of the planning horizon. So the temporal context or the temporal frame of reference here is to focus our attention on the planning horizon. And at, beyond the planning horizon, you might say, everything discounts to zero. We just disregard it. So the choice of planning horizon is really what's critical. I put forward the argument that a reasonable planning horizon duration would be 100 years because that's about how long it takes for most of the global warming effect to take place um, after greenhouse gases are emitted into the atmosphere when we're talking about short-term climate change or short-term responses. To the greenhouse gases. Moreover, that 100 year period is sufficiently long, I, I assume, or I, I, it must be sufficiently long, for civilization to respond. In other words, if we set this floor price for about 100 years out to the future, because that's our planning horizon, then market participants have a, a reasonably good idea of what the reward is going to be for that period of time. For example, if, if it were the year 2045, as shown in this diagram, we could look back to the historical spot price and the historical floor price for the reward. Into the future, there would be a guaranteed period of floor prices, and uh, that might go out for 10 or 15 or 20 years, approximately. And beyond that, we get the forward guidance, which would take us out to the year uh, 2140. This chart's not quite long enough to show that, but I think you understand. So the forward guidance is um, an estimate, and it builds into the policy some flexibility so that the carbon exchange authority and the central banks can adjust the, uh, the floor price in the future to rise or fall a bit in response to changing risks. So in, to conclude, we don't actually have uh, any social discount rate, and I believe this is um, a much more logical way to resolve 
the conundrum of discount rates at either too low or too high in relation to the systemic risks that are building up uh, in the climate system. To understand a bit better what I'm talking about or what the conceptual model is about, it's very helpful for us to come back to the original problem as it is biophysically in relation to the fast carbon cycle. So this diagram ignores the slow carbon cycle, not that it's not important, it's just that uh, it's too much information at this point. So here, the fast carbon cycle, quite obviously, it includes this anthropogenic perturbation, the emissions of fossil fuel-based greenhouse gases and so on, land use change, of roughly, uh, say, nine gigatons of pure carbon per year. And that goes in the atmosphere. Uh, it's well mixed. Then some of it leaves the atmosphere because it's being absorbed into the ocean through process of diffusion. Some of the carbon is also taken up by land mass uh, because of vegetation's cap capacity to absorb CO2 in the process of photosynthesis. If the surface vegetation puts on more mass, it's by sequestering some of that carbon. And the carbon, of course, also comes back into the atmosphere. And if you look at respiration from plants and other organisms, it pretty much adds up to the rate of photosynthesis, 120 gigatons of carbon in and 120 out. It's a bit of terrestrial uptake here, another three, maybe into soil carbon and so on. But basically it's fairly balanced uh, on the Earth's surface when there is no global warming and if, if, if the biosphere is relatively stable in terms of its climate. So this diagram, what I want to point out here is that if we think more deeply about what the fast carbon cycle is about, why it has this particular uh, features of sources and sinks, then we can revise our conceptual model for the world economy. So I'll just point out some scientific facts about the fast carbon cycle. If we look at the ocean, first of all, um, CO2 is going into the ocean, true, and then it's coming out as well, depending on the relative concentration of CO2 in the water and the atmosphere. If the atmospheric concentration is relatively high, there is a net absorption into the ocean, or it diffuses into the ocean through the process of diffusion. Now, this is actually driven at the molecular level, to do with the probabilities and concentrations. But something important about this process is that it's actually occurring in one system, okay? It's going into the ocean and out the ocean. And this system physically is more or less, uh, would say it's not alive because it's, we're talking about water and gases. It's, not, it's a non-living system, although there's a lot of life in the ocean, but generally it, it's, it's non-living. There's uh, photosynthesis and uh, sorry, decomposition of organic matter, which is interacting, but the diffusion process itself is, is a non-living process. It's purely physical. If we look over to the left side and we focus our attention on uh, biomass, it's quite different because photosynthesis specifically is pulling CO2 in to, into the plant matter and uh, respiration is another biochemical metabolic pathway that's putting it out into the atmosphere. And the point I want to make here is simply this. When we look at living systems, it's more complex than for non-living systems. In particular, living systems are characterized by two distinct metabolic pathways, photosynthesis and respiration. So there's a dual uh, or complementary relationship between cells and organisms that photosynthesize and those that respire. And, and that's simply the point, that that is the way complex living systems work. Now, if we are to <clears throat> move forward as a civilization, we have to admit that we're going to need carbon dioxide removal 
of some capacity because we have the issue of residual emissions. Uh, it's difficult to decarbonize perfectly on a gross level. We're going to have to need it probabilistically. Whether we like it or not, that's where we're headed and we have to deal with that reality. So this is a new reality that we may need to take out of the atmosphere roughly three gigatons of carbon per year. Note, note the units, we're not talking carbon dioxide. Okay, so I just added that in to complete the diagram where we have this system that's removing carbon and this system that's emitting carbon to the atmosphere. So uh, given what I said about photosynthesis and respiration, what I, I'd like us to think about now is the actual thermodynamics of that system. So this diagram, it shows on the left uh, a fungus because a fungus is a respiring organism. This circle is actually meant to represent all kinds of respiring cells and organisms. So um, it includes animals, it includes single cellular, and it includes the cells in plants that respire. On the right side, this circle uh, represents photosynthesis. So it only represents those cells, i.e. chloroplast, that can actually photosynthesize. That's the way the diagram is arranged. So this is not a regular biological diagram. It's certainly not an economic diagram, but it's a, a thermodynamic diagram representing the two kinds of systems and the two metabolic pathways in, in, in ecosystems, ecosystems in an oxygenated environment. The point I want to make here is that um, if we think of systems in this way, we have the opportunity to develop a new conceptual model for achieving net zero. Because this is this slide's titled Ecosystems and Net Zero Limited Homeostasis. So I'll explain what this means. It's quite involved, but it's particularly important. First of all, um, there's this lock symbol, like a padlock, which is put they're next to respiration by cells and organisms. And what that's referring to is the notion that respiring cells and organisms, no matter how evolved they are, they are extremely unlikely to be able to photosynthesize. Okay, They can't do the reverse metabolic pathway. And it's because they're specialized in terms of their DNA. So for example, you can't simply take a human being or any other animal or a fungus and have that organism suddenly photosynthesize. It's just not possible. I can't photosynthesize, you can't. We only breathe out CO2 uh, for respiration and we are locked in genetically to that metabolism. This fact that um, cells specialize, cells and organisms specialize for respiration photosynthesis is a key uh, feature of evolution. And there are reasons for it. But those reasons are hard to um, uh, elaborate here and now. I won't try to, but we just have to accept the fact at this point that cells and organisms are specialized. They evolve from and through their DNA, and they don't have the ability to flip-flop or reverse their metabolism. The technical term for this essentially is irreversibility. So there is thermodynamic and chemical irreversibility built in to, to these cells and organisms. And that's really the key point. Now, if we focus our attention on the actual chemistry, there is another important point about these two pathways. On the left, respiration. Um, importantly, from a thermodynamic perspective, this chemical reaction is described as spontaneous. And the reason is the, the Gibbs free energy is negative, meaning that it can drive on its own if it's triggered to do so. The actual chemistry of respiration is not as simple as this. This is just a simplified formula that shows sugars, oxygen, CO2, water, and heat as uh, reactants and products. It's simply presented to explain the concepts. It's not saying that's the actual chemistry because the actual chemistry is much more complex. It involves uh, ATP and all sorts of things, which I don't claim to understand. But we don't necessarily need to because the key point is that 
it's a spontaneous reaction and it can move forward relatively easily. Whereas with photosynthesis, it's the reverse situation. So the problem or the challenge um, chemically is to take carbon out of the atmosphere in a diffuse form, combine it with water and light energy to produce sugars and oxygen. So chloroplast has evolved uh, for that purpose, to, it is its survival strategy, and it managed, manages to do that quite well. But you couldn't say it's an easy thing to do. Thermodynamically, it's not easy because it's a non-spontaneous reaction. It requires energy inputs from the surroundings, and you need a very specialized DNA structure to capture the photons, send the energy to the reactor center, produce sugars, and so on and so forth. So that, that's the lay of the land of um, the ecosystems in terms of what they're doing uh, biologically, chemically, thermodynamically to put CO2 in the atmosphere and take it out again. Now, up here in the title, you notice I wrote limited homeostasis. Now, what does that mean? Well, the question here about homeostasis is not so much about the homeostasis, the cells and the fungi or whatever. Um, I'm really referring to the level of CO2 in the atmosphere. So does the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere stay the same? Is there homeostasis? Well, in fact, there is to a certain degree. There is limited homeostasis. Why is that? Well, if you have a, a complete system with an outer boundary that has stable energy flows in and out, then within that system, you can have plants and animals, a whole ecosystem, and it eventually can achieve homeostasis in terms of CO2 in its atmosphere. Why is that? Well, the reason is that um, it can do so because this system actually operates somewhat like an open loop control system in that the rate of photosynthesis determines the availability of sugars that feed into the systems for respiration. So as long as this um, supply of sugar or food, if you like, is constant through time, then the output of CO2 will generally eventually balance the input or the biosequestration of CO2. So that's why the system can achieve homeostasis. So if you look at the planet as a whole, if the climate's stable, vegetation is maximized, it will achieve uh, homeostasis in CO2. And we actually see this or signs of this through the seasonal signal of CO2 rising and falling in the Keeling curve. That's a very good example of what I'm discussing. That's the way it works. However, this limited homeostasis is not so great that it can uh, withstand major disruption. What kind of disruption could disturb the homeostasis of CO2 in the atmosphere for this kind of system? Well, if we change the energy balance of the outer boundary, it can uh, force this system out of balance. And that's what would happen if uh, more energy came into the system through global warming or changes in albedo. The problem there is that uh, it's going to change rainfall patterns and create stresses for plants. So plants might increase their photosynthesis or they might decrease their photosynthesis, but it could change. Now, if it decreases, let's say because of desiccation of the Amazon, you don't have as much sugar and there's going to be uh, potentially um, more respiration than photosynthesis until eventually they rebalance again. And that could mean um, conversion of Amazon rainforest into savanna or something like that. There's another process going on too, and that is increases in CO2 in the atmosphere. And what does that mean? Well, if you have a high concentration of CO2, it's driving more diffusion through the stomata of the leaves of the plants, and that's going to drive more photosynthesis potentially for a period, and that can create more sugars and more growth, and eventually respiration will catch up to be balanced again. So there is some limited capacity for homeostasis, but the point I make is that um, homeostasis and CO2 in the atmosphere in this system 
ultimately depends on the energy balance of the whole outer boundary to be constant in time. If we don't have that, this system cannot necessarily um, continue to stabilise to be homeostatic. This is the problem we face ultimately uh, with global warming and instability of uh, vegetation and forests and so on to store carbon. Some forests might store more carbon uh, with global warming and others less, but overall pl at a planetary level, at some point it could become a net source of greenhouse gases, say at two and a half degrees of global warming or something like that, we could find the land mass becoming a net source of CO2. And, and, and that's um, really what I wanted to say. So I've said a few things, I'll just recap. I've explained that this system has some homeostasis. It's a, called a uh, open loop control system. It only has limited capacity for homeostasis. It's dependent on constant boundary conditions on the outer. Otherwise, it won't uh, maintain true homeostasis. Okay, that's the ecosystem. So what about our economy and our civilization? What I propose is that um, we can take inspiration from nature, and indeed, indeed, I believe that we should be, to develop a parallel economy that... Uh, thermodynamically, if you like, or at the systems level, can achieve true homeostasis. So for homeostasis to occur, it, it must also satisfy certain criteria thermodynamically, in my opinion. And this diagram has enough complexity that it can mimic the, the previous diagram, which has only limited homeostasis. So why would this system diagram for civilization with two economies, which I'll describe, why could it achieve true homeostasis rather than limited homeostasis? Well, the answer is because in this system diagram, we can actually implement what's called a closed loop control system. A closed loop control system is superior to an open loop because it would actually include uh, an, a feedback mechanism where information cycles through to uh, maintain homeostasis. And the homeostasis that we're discussing here is the CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, I'll touch on that in the next slide. Uh, at this point, I just want to explain what this slide is telling us. So the left side, this symbolizes the economy that we currently have. It's a consumptive economy. It's structured by fiat money fiat currencies such as US dollar, euro, etc., all the currencies in the world that exist. And the money that is in circulation in, in the general economy is more than 95% debt-based money. That's because the money supply generally is created by commercial banks as debt. And that debt, as I explained in earlier slides of the same presentation, part one, um, is a driving force for more growth, more energy consumption. So this economy, uh, the way it works is it takes in carbon-based energy, fossil fuels primarily, or so biofuels. It takes in some clean energy as we increase our renewable energy systems, and it puts out waste heat. But chemically, it puts out CO2 and other greenhouse gases. A simplified formula for the chemistry is simply this. Fossil fuels plus oxygen gives us CO2 and water, vapor, and heat. Um, this is combustion, typically, of some kind, and therefore it tends to be spontaneous. Uh, it will happen quite easily, given the right conditions. So it's a very favourable uh, metabolism or chemical pathway because you get a lot of heat out, a lot of energy to do useful work, to produce goods and services. Okay. On the right side, this is the mitigation economy or the parallel economy that doesn't exist at this point. But this is the economy that could be created with the carbon currency. So you note that this economy is structured by our carbon currency, XCC. The consumptive economy is structured by national fiat currencies. The carbon currency is 100% debt-free as an asset. It's not a medium of exchange, so it's not an economy that um, is designed at all for consumption. 
it's got a very specific purpose, and that's to mitigate. In this diagram, you'll notice that CO2 is going in, and what that implies is that this system here is actually and actively taking carbon out the atmosphere, and it's called carbon dioxide removal, or negative emissions technologies, or greenhouse gas removal. Now, um, the way it's structured under the policy is that we use the carbon currency to finance this and create this economy based on the rules I described, rules one, two, three, four, five, six. The action of pulling carbon out the atmosphere is managed under rule three explicitly. And the carbon reward uh, is the value of the carbon currency and that's the explicit price for this carbon removal. That's why this diagram makes sense because we're explicitly referring to the carbon reward price over the long term. We remember the floor price that's guaranteed. Uh, this system here will take energy from the environment, clean energy could be sunlight, wind, and it could also take energy uh, from the grid if there's renewable energy or some other sources of energy, but it would have to be clean. If it were dirty, it wouldn't be very effective at carbon removal. It also gives off waste heat. Now, this mitigation economy, as shown, is a bit more sophisticated than what this diagram actually hints at because rules one and two under the same policy will also help to decarbonize this system internally. So rules one and two for cleaner energy, cleaner business, that's the supply side and the demand side of energy, uh, will operate in this system to reallocate resources to accelerate the decarbonization of the consumptive economy. This is very important because that, that's called conventional mitigation. And that needs to be accelerated as fast as possible because we can't rely on carbon removal um, forever. It's, it, it's something that we, we'd only want to implement at an optimistically low rate. Otherwise, we become too dependent on it. We, we also have to decarbonize and reduce the CO2 emissions as fast as possible. So this diagram, it is not a conventional economic diagram. It's really a thermodynamic diagram because it shows the energy inputs and outputs. The carbon reward itself is a conduit for energy and other resources because it has purchasing power. It's implied that that purchasing power is transferring access to resources and energy from this system and transferring into this system. If we look at the formulas, once again, we should remind ourselves that behind these basic formulas uh, is a thermodynamic story. So the story is that combustion, okay, being spontaneous, is, is very easy to trigger. You, metaphorically or literally, all you need is a match and you can burn stuff. So that's why it's so convenient. Whereas if you look at this reaction, um, it, it has what's called a positive Gibbs free energy generally. Therefore, it's non-spontaneous, and that's why it's difficult. If you listen to what pundits say about carbon dioxide removal and carbon capture storage and so on, they will often remind us that these technologies haven't gone to scale and they're expensive, okay? But the general public might not really understand why that's the case. It's not necessarily because the technicians and engineers and whomever are lazy or they don't care about the climate or they don't care about carbon removal. The, the underlying problem is that you need a lot of energy to input into the system to actually complete the removal process. So if you're inputting energy, in this case, light, it's photosynthesis, uh, that's a cost. And you can't get that energy back because the energy is locked up in the um, biosequestered carbon or the carbon dioxide gas that you pump down into the ground in storage. So that energy cost, generally speaking, it can't be recovered. The products also are not necessarily economically um, saleable. So if you have a sequestration process, whatever it might happen to be, the products are not saleable on the market and you've got to put energy into the process, that's expensive. And this is why it, it's difficult to roll out at a large scale cost. 
This side here on the left, we come back to the consumptive economy. There's something also I just want to point out, which should be obvious, but perhaps it's not that obvious. And that is this system here is actually doing useful work in, in, in a literal sense. It's taking uh, fossil fuels or other sources of energy. It's using it to produce goods and services. And then there's heat given off and greenhouse gases as waste often. And because it's designed for that purpose, that that is its reason for existing, it is by every measure, by every account, it is literally a heat engine, okay? So if you have a heat engine, uh, literally, whether you use the phrase heat engine to describe the consumptive economy or to describe a, a steam engine or a machine or a car or a factory, these heat engines, uh, they Im have inherently an optimization requirement. And that is the logical optimization is to increase the useful work done, the production of goods and services versus the inputs. And this is why ultimately economists and engineers and scientists and everybody on the planet more or less is always working to improve the efficiency of this system and technologies. It's because it is a heat engine. It's maximizing outputs for inputs because the inputs are energy and the output is uh, goods and services that requires useful work and it's framed by this exothermic reaction. On the other hand, if you start thinking about the reverse reaction, um, the thermodynamics is different. It's endothermic and non-spontaneous, and this is why it's inherently problematic and costly. Unless we wrap our minds around this, I don't think we're really going to understand what we're doing macroeconomically or in policy terms. So um, why, why I say that is that if you look at all the ways we can um, mitigate emissions and, and actually pull carbon out of the atmosphere, they have this inherent cost because of the thermodynamic barrier. And this is another reason why the optimization for the mitigation economy, the parallel economy, is a different type of optimization. It's not the same kind of optimization because this is not a classic heat engine. It's something quite different. So in this slide, I just want to um, reiterate and emphasize what I was talking about a moment ago, and that is this model is actually the model for optimal growth from a thermodynamic or systems level perspective. If we think about other models, which are much simpler than this, such as steady state, green growth or degrowth, in my opinion, they just do not actually address the problem of greenhouse gas emissions uh, and climate change because they're just too simple. Moreover, they ultimately rely on the consumptive economy. So for example, if we were to entertain the idea of green growth to solve climate change, we're basically stuck with the consumptive economy only, and we're limited by its uh, specialization for producing goods and services using fiat currencies, which are uh, debt-based forms of money. Remember, debt drives more economic activity and growth and energy consumption. So in a, in a sense, you might say that we're using fiat money, debt-based money, because it's very efficient for driving production. Now, um, on the right side, um, we would need the carbon currency and the global carbon reward policy. And what I want to point out about optimal growth is that the reason it's called optimal growth is because we're actually going to transition or transfer, I should say, energy and resources from the left system into the right system. And we do that through changing the carbon reward price over time, the floor price, to pull carbon out of the atmosphere and to mitigate in here. And also we have another lever for uh, transferring resources across and that, that other lever are all the reward rules. So rules one and two have very wide scope to be applied around the world for all kinds of uh, cleaner energy, uh, substituting fossil fuels, and all kinds of decarbonization for every sector and industry of the economy, 
in particular, those sectors and industries that are very difficult to decarbonise otherwise and are needed to decarbonise quickly to achieve our goals. So I actually use the phrase strategic mitigation when using rules one and two. That's explained in the policy working paper. Uh, go to the Appendix B for the examples and read through the main body of the paper. So in a nutshell, what is optimal growth? Well, it involves a closed-loop control system where we feed back information from the environment to readjust the carbon reward to make sure we have enough decarbonisation in this system and enough carbon removal from this with this system. The optimization of the mainstream economy, the consumptive economy, is the same as it always has been, and that's uh, improving productive efficiency or the efficiency of production of goods and services. That is the characteristic optimization choice for the consumptive economy because it acts as a heat engine. On the right side, the optimization is different. And it's to uh, achieve a certain probability of achieving a safe carbon budget. So if we talk about the probabilities of a safe carbon budget through carbon removal and mitigation here, effectively what we're discussing is the management of risk. And so this is why this policy is framed by uh, risk as a concept and the risk cost to carbon as the metric that sets the ideal carbon reward through time. So that's um, the summary. These diagrams I've shown you, um, they're not explicitly control system diagrams because I just wanted to save time and not get too deep into the technical details of how control systems work. But the key point of a control system is that you have an information feedback loop. So that feedback loop for information is provided by the Carbon Exchange Authority, the institution. It collects the information from around the world. And over a period of about five years, it will revise the carbon reward floor price into the future, setting new rules every five years as the positive feedback or the negative feedback to ensure that there is enough mitigation. And that's how the closed loop control system is actually constructed. The thinking and the theory behind this is explained in more detail in Appendix A of the policy working paper. So I strongly recommend that you read Appendix A to understand optimal growth. And it's also explained in section 6.5, I believe, in the discussion, which talks about green growth degrowth, and optimal growth. A point here is that degrowth, its limitation is that it's still only looking at the consumptive economy. And what it's attempting to do is set some limits on its growth through some sort of uh, top-down measure for austerity, be it over consumption of fossil fuels, limiting access to energy and resources. Um, it could also depend on bottom-up lifestyle changes. However, in my opinion, this is just my opinion, you don't have to agree with me, of course. My opinion is that degrowth will not solicit enough cooperation or not enough cooperation quickly enough to actually manage the global carbon budget. Whereas with this approach, uh, we have a definite feedback mechanism, it's a heuristic, that can actually macroeconomically lever resources and allocate them to where they're going to be most effective. Effective because the reward itself is given proportional to the actual mass of greenhouse gases that are mitigated. That mass is directly proportional, explicitly proportional to CO2 removal. The masses for conventional mitigation are only notional. They're notional because the reward under rules one and two are based on flexible pricing. Why? And that's simply to be effective. We simply adjust the price or the reward based on what's going to be effective to achieve our physical objectives. So that's the optimal growth model. It is distinctly different to green growth, degrowth, and steady state. 
um, in some respects, it is a, simply a more advanced form of steady state because steady state as a concept is actually quite simplistic. What we're discussing here is homeostasis and the ability to establish a closed loop control system. So thank you very much. That's the end of part two. There's a lot of ideas and thinking in there. Um, I, I, I'm not saying it's uh, easy to grasp at first, but I hope that you um, find it helpful. And if you have questions or concerns, please reach out to us. I'll answer your technical questions. If you want more information, I strongly recommend you go online to our website and apply to review the Global Carbon Reward Policy Working Paper, because that paper uh, actually expels out these ideas. Thank you very much.